1 Kings 18. First Kings 18, verse 1. It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. When it says third year, it means of this terrible drought that was on the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah which was the governor of his house, Ahab's the king of Israel. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, had the kind of respect you're supposed to have for God, for it was so when Jezebel, the evil wife of Ahab, cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water, with food. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land and all the fountains of the water and all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him. And he fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? What terrible thing have I done that you would send me on this mission? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord is going to tell you to go somewhere else where I don't know. And when I come and tell Ahab uh, and he can't find you, he is surely going to put me to death. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he's going to kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will be here. I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Those of you who are familiar with this chapter in the Bible know that there is a counting down to a famous showdown that's coming. A showdown between having God at the center or idolatry having someone or something else at the center, there's coming a big showdown in the physical realm about to happen. There's only one true God. There's only one true revelation of that God. That revelation came through confirmed symbols and messages that have been recorded and delivered down to us. We're blessed to have the Bible, the inspired words of a holy God. When received, it is indeed good news. It is the gospel. It is reliable. It is life-giving and life-sustaining. It is the message of truth. It works. It fits. It satisfies. It improves us from the inside out. When we are hearing and believing it, it changes us. It cannot be denied. But the false gospels and false gods bring nothing but heartache, emptiness, and harm. They may be presented as good. They may be promoted as answers. But ultimately, they fail. They fall short. The true gospel offers true peace with God through the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that began to be spoken to Adam and Eve through the animal 
sacrifice, the blood that had to be shed for them to be clothed. That peace with God offers and provides a growing peace with yourself. You've heard me talk about that on a number of occasions. That's very important. God first has to have you at peace with Him. And then through His Word and through the relationship that He has through His truth in your heart, He will help you to be at peace with yourself, which naturally spreads out to peace with others as much as lieth in you. It goes in that order. It has to. In other words, the true gospel works. The true gospel works. I say true because there are false gospels out there, aren't there? The true gospel can have a subtle at first, a subtle at first change to where it becomes false. It's my, what I call my HGTV illustration, except this time it's in reverse. You've learned, you've heard me talk about when Christ becomes the center of our lives. uh, There's nothing that appears different on the outside. The only difference is that we have a new owner. That's what I mean by my HGTV illustration. You have a dilapidated house that's been neglected, it's been abused, just like we have. But now you have somebody who owns it that is God. It's different. Everything still looks bad. Still dilapidated, but there's a plan to change it. The one who sits on the eternal throne now occupies the center of your heart and life. He brings light, purpose, and revelation. Behold, immediately all things are new, aren't they? Even though people may look at you and say, I don't see any change. All things are new because you have a new owner. The same principle that changed us from darkness to light, unfortunately, can work in reverse. The same principle can be true of a changed gospel. Where once God was at the center, everything still looks the same right now. Nothing looks different. The same Bible is still being used. The same words are still spoken. All of the same testimonies are still talked about. He's talked about. But the scriptures are used in a way that at first is very different, but it's tragic. Behold, all things are become different. Where when you are saved, it's no longer about you. The gospel can be changed where it's no longer about God and what man means to God. It's about man and what God means to and for man. It's a subtle change. Just like the subtle change that happened when Christ came and lived on the throne of your heart, and I hope he's done that, he changes everything, but nothing looks changed yet. The same is true of a false gospel that just pushes God off of that throne and puts man where God belongs. And it doesn't look any different to the observer at first but it's a changed gospel. Paul writing in Galatians 1.6 said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I'm amazed at how fast that happened. That you've been removed from Christ. How soon from him that called you into the gospel, the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That's Galatians 1.6. I'm I'm amazed how quickly that has happened. You hear it in Romans 1, that summary chapter of how mankind and human culture is destroyed. That's the big uh, condensed version of human society coming down to ruin. It goes from knowing and glorifying God, having Him right where He belongs, glorify Him. That means put Him in His proper place go from knowing and glorifying God all the way down in that degradation that Romans 1 describes to idol worship and sex our way instead of his way and animal and environmental worship instead of the worship of the one who made it all. 
It's tragic when we care more about the climate change than the gospel change, isn't it? Because there is godly power in the God-centered gospel. But if you change the center, it may not look any different at first. But oh, it's tragically different. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ It is the power of God. It's the fire of God. It's the power of God. I'm not ashamed of it because it works. It's the power of God. It's the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Unto salvation, he goes on to say, to everyone who is believing, it's powerful. It works. And don't forget the last part of that verse. Quote, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The rightness of God is revealed in the gospel. How good and how righteous and how holy He is. God is right and good in His purpose, in who He is, in His actions and His cause. He is is righteous. But in Romans 1, it says in verse 23, they change the glory of the uncorruptible God. That just means they changed His place where he was central. The focus was central on him. They changed his position and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Doesn't look different at first. They're still using the same Bible. They're still using the same lingo. They're still singing the same songs. But it's changed. The glory of God has been changed and man has taken his place. Romans 1.25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And there is a showdown between gospels today. There's a showdown. Which gospel has the fire of God? I'm not talking about emotion. I'm talking about the one that has real depth and meaning and change. To change lives for God and His purpose versus the one that's failing. Which gospel changes individuals? Which gospel changes families? Which which gospel changes society? Which gospel causes a man to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? What gospel is that? We know Job said those words. Everything that could go wrong in his life went wrong in his life. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What gospel does that? It's a gospel that's certainly not about me. And it's about God and what he's doing. Because though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What gospel was his wife believing? She said, you ought to curse God and die. What good is he for you? Which gospel works? Which gospel has Daniel praying as he always had in the face of being fed to the hungry lions? Which gospel inspired those in Hebrews 11 to choose a horrible, painful death over denying their Lord? If you haven't read the last part of Hebrews 11, do it. Because the first part's all about the victories. You know, David over Goliath, it's all about conquering lions and all of that. But the last part of that talks about those who never got their earthly deliverance and how good they are. The question that came from Darius to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver? And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whenever they faced the fiery furnace, they said, our God's able to deliver. No, no question about it, but whether he does or not, we are not going to bow down to your false God. What kind of gospel does that? It's only a God-centered gospel. Not one that's focused on man and his needs and what he's after. It's God and what he's after. That, that's the gospel that changes men to where they'll go to their death gladly, almost. 
and leave a beating, rejoicing, as the disciples did when they were beaten for preaching the gospel. What kind of gospel is that? It's the true gospel. What about no earthly deliverance for Stephen as he was being executed for being uh, preaching the gospel? He was being stoned and being bloodied and beaten before he died. And in Acts 7 and verse 56, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And every Sunday we talk about him sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. But when Stephen saw him, he was standing because he came to Stephen even in his death. And Stephen knew it. He said, I see Jesus. He's on his feet. He's on his feet. What kind of gospel sends men to the gallows instead of denying their faith? It's the true God-centered gospel that's been changed tragically and unfortunately for too many in the day in which we live. It's not changing lives. What did Stephen do whenever they finally, his last ounce of ebbing strength, what did he say? Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he died, the Bible says. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what the Lord Jesus said, wasn't it? What kind of gospel is that? It changes men instead of bitterness and anger and hatred towards those who are abusing them and working against them to love and forgiveness and just wanting them to know the God that you know. What kind of gospel is that? It's the true gospel. It's a showdown between the true God and all the faults and all the bales of our world, all the substitute centers. And the question is, how is your gospel working? How's your God working? Whatever it is, it's capital G or lowercase g, how's it working? What you put first, what you put in the center, how's it working? The true gospel moves men to true sacrifice, to standing up against evil while loving those caught in the grips of wrong. They stand up against it. And they don't envy those who are better off in this world, they pity those who are better off in this world because of a gospel that works. Look at Obadiah here in 1 Kings 18, verses 3 and 4. 1 Kings 18, 3, we've already read it. Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Ahab was a wicked king of Israel, as many of you know. He had turned away from God to idolatry. And Obadiah, though, the governor of his house, respected the Lord God greatly, it says. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took and hid a hundred of them and fed them and kept them alive. That's what this gospel will do. It will cause you to protect those who are standing up for God. Then as the king of Israel, Ahab, meets The word through Elijah, look at chapter 18 and verse 17. 1 Kings 18, 17. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. You have, and your father's house, in that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you've followed after Balaam. I'm not the troublemaker. I'm not the hater. You are because you've forsaken the Lord God. And you think I'm the troublemaker. Are the ones who hold to the true gospel, are they the troublemakers? Are they the haters? And certainly we may be called that today. But are we really? Or do we love every person and want every person to come to know the God that we know? And say, Lord, Lay not the sin to their charge. Is that our attitude? Or is it the ones who have moved God out of the center who are the haters? Are the troublemakers? 
in God's sight, the troublemakers are those who have changed the gospel, have changed the center, not Elijah. Someone said, I saw this quote somewhere, but I don't know exactly who said it, but I wanted you to know I didn't. Quote, idolatry is turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. Turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. That's idolatry, isn't it? Something other than God. He's the ultimate thing. Have we turned good things into idolatry? Are things more important than God? It's time for a showdown of the Gospels, isn't it? 1 Kings 18, 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, if that's the gospel that you're believing, then follow it. The people answered not a word. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think Joshua said something very similar to that, didn't he? Stop this back and forth stuff. Is it God or is it Baal? Is it God or is it the society in which we are living? Quit fence sitting. Quit trying to please yourself and God. Quit trying to please the culture and God. Choose you this day whom you will serve. All these false gods, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. There's coming a showdown. Which God are you serving? Or which gospel are you believing? Let's have a showdown and see which one has the fire of heaven. God, through Paul, speaks of a gospel that has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof, 2 Timothy 3, 5. It has a form of godliness. It appears to be godliness, but it denies the power of it. Why? Because if God's not in the center, it robs the gospel of its power to change lives, to to give answers that satisfy. Deny its power. A gospel without power to change lives. A gospel, maybe it'll make you feel good. Maybe it'll pack a a building. A gospel that appeals to itching ears, maybe. But a gospel that really changes people. Denies the power thereof. From such a gospel that has all the trappings and outward show, but no real power, God says, turn away from it. Let's remember what happened here with Elijah in the majority of the gospel of his day. 1 Kings 18, 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long are you going to halt between these two opinions? Verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. We know there were those that were being hidden in the, in the cave, but he's talking about right here. Look, look at the odds today. I'm the only one here. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and don't put any fire under it. I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. You call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of my God. And these are physical events that God surely did and put on display, but they represent spiritual things. They represent the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change lives, to purify people. To make differences in our world. He said, which one will have the fire? Let's find out right now. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, well spoken. Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you the bullock yourself, dress it, lay it out there. And they took the bullock in verse 26 and it was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning until Noon saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there wasn't a voice. And I want you to know, demonic powers are involved in false worship, and the Bible makes that clear. But God was 
doing something today, their gods weren't allowed to do anything. Nor any that answered. They leaped upon the altar which they had made, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, uh, for, for he is a god, either he's busy talking somewhere, or maybe he's gone to the bathroom. That's what a lot of people translate this word, pursuing. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Or he's in a journey, or maybe he's sleeping and needs somebody to wake him up. Can you imagine? God told Elijah what was going to happen, so this was fun for him, I'm sure. They cried aloud. They, they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets. That means they would do this. They would cut themselves till the blood gushed out upon them, trying to appease their gods and try to get their gods to respond. And I want you to know that a lot of people doing that today, they're cutting themselves and they're hurting themselves and they're refusing the true God that brings satisfaction. It came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. This was happening all day. And no voice, no answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near, come to me. And all the people came, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The altar of the true God, of the true gospel, had been broken down. And he built it back up. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the tribes of, of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He built back the altar in the name of the Lord and put the Lord center in the center. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid it on the wood and, and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the sacrifice and on the wood. He wanted everyone to know this was an act of God, not a trick. He had them douse the whole thing with water time and time again. They'd do it the second time. They did it the second time. He said, do it the third time. They did it the third time. The water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that you're the God in Israel and that I am your servant. I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your word, not my own. And all these faith healers and all of those guys that it doesn't work because God didn't say it. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Let them know that you are wanting them to return to him. Elijah rebuilt the place of true worship, of the offering that represented Jesus Christ, and worship in the name of the Lord. Verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When God's fire was finished, there was no water left and the sacrifice was burned and the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God and according to the law that God had given them if anybody dares speak against the things of God and become a false prophet they were to be put to death I've often said you want to do away with false prophets today you know God's standard was 100% accuracy or death you want to get rid of all the false prophets today? Make that their standard. I don't claim to be a prophet. I claim to be one who preaches the word of God, and you're supposed to check it out. If I'm wrong, show me. But a prophet in those days was claiming, I'm speaking the words of God. I'm, I'm the one speaking the inspired words of God. And they, if they were wrong, they were to be put to death. There's a showdown, isn't there? 
Which God are you serving? Which God are you believing and trusting? There's a showdown going on right now. Which God really satisfies? Which God really speaks to the heart of man? Which gospel makes a difference? It's the one that God is at the center and not man. God help us. I want us to sing an invitation hymn.